Welcome to NCIX Tech Tips. Today's episode is going to be about SATA or SATA or Serial ATA. So let's start with a little history lesson and that is why I brought along this motherboard right here to my left, your right. And let's have a look at what SATA replaced. No, not Jonathan Fatality Wendell, but rather the IDE interface. So IDE or Parallel ATA is what we used to use to connect our drives, that is hard drives, optical drives, whatever the case may be, to our motherboard or to our storage cards. So IDE had some complications and limitations. You had to set master and slave devices. It was a big, fat, wide ribbon cable that was just bleh, just ugly. It was hampered airflow, inconvenient, all that stuff. So, and it was also slow slow compared to what we were going to need down the road from a storage interface. So, a few years back, boards started shipping with not only IDE or Parallel ATA, but also SATA or Serial ATA. So we're going to talk about all the different flavors and the evolution SATA has taken since that time and what the benefits are of all the different sorts. So let's start with the physical characteristics of the original SATA. So I'm going to get the cameraman to come in close on my ancient legacy board here for one to, for starters, okay? So right here you can see our SATA interface has pins for data all along the underside of the connector. It is in an L shape, so it can only be plugged in one way to correspond with the cable that it goes with. And the original SATA connectors, actually this cable is not quite old enough to demonstrate this, but they had no locks whatsoever to secure them. So once you plugged in the cable, there was actually very little to prevent it from coming out and very little to prevent it from breaking off like this. Okay, so that was a bit of a problem with the original SATA spec. So SATA 1 ports can usually be identified by the characteristics that I just showed you. And SATA 1 cables can also be identified by those characteristics. Now SATA 2 saw things take a bit of an evolutionary step. First of all, SATA 2 was when we first started seeing the ports at a right angle off the side of the board as opposed to only sticking straight up although there are a fair number of modern boards that also use uh, SATA ports that come straight out of the board as well as ones that come off at a right angle. Okay, SATA 2 also saw the introduction of fancy things like locking connectors. So you can see how each of these SATA interfaces has a shroud around it that has space for a lock. So this right here is a locking cable. So it's got two little bumps right here which correspond to the two little grooves here in the connector. So I can go ahead, I can put this in and I can tug on it. It's a lot more sturdy. You can see the whole board itself will flex before I can break that connector off because of the housing around it. And I also can't pull it out no matter how hard I pull. So what I have to do is I have to release the latch and pull it out. So it made SATA more secure as well as being faster, more convenient, better for airflow, and all of those other advantages that it had over IDE. Now I mentioned speed before. Locking cables is certainly not the only thing that evolved as SATA has gone from SATA 1 to SATA 2 to SATA 3. And those terminologies are not correct. I will actually tell you the proper terminologies in a moment. But speed was the biggest one. So SATA, the original spec, was at 100 at 1.5 gigabit per second, okay? So that was a little bit faster than the fastest IDE connections and really this is a Western Digital Caviar Black 2 terabyte drive. This is pretty much as fast as mechanical hard drives are going to be for quite a while. And a SATA 1, 1.5 gigabit per second interface is still just fine for that. So why did we need to move to SATA 2, 3, or rather the correct term, SATA 3 gigabit per second? The reason was that there were drives coming that would need that thoroughput. So this is an SSD. SSDs pretty much need a SATA 3 gigabit per second connection or colloquial known as SATA 2, so I'm going to keep calling it SATA 2. They need a SATA 2 interface in order to perform up to par. So performance was one of the big reasons that we transitioned over to SATA 2. 
So what about SATA 3? I'm going to show you guys a SATA 3, and I'm saying this again. SATA 3 is the colloquial term. It is not correct because of how easily it can be confused with SATA 2, 3 gigabit per second, because officially that's SATA 3 gigabit per second. So this is SATA 6 gigabit per second. So that means it's capable of well over 500 megabytes per second sustained reads and writes. And we've actually got SSDs that are just coming out on the market now, which can not only saturate a SATA 2, 3 gigabit per second bus, but even move beyond that, almost to the point where they can saturate a SATA 3 6 gigabit per second bus. So this is the Intel uh, 510 series SSD, but there's a couple others as well. So I'm going to show you guys now the difference between a SATA 3 cable and a SATA 2 cable. So the difference uh, is that there's a color code change. Uh, you can see the connector is slightly physically longer. And you can see that it has a little label on it that says ASUS SATA 6 gigabit per second. So the reality of it is SATA cables are kind of like uh, Ethernet cables where they're all physically the same. They've all got the same pins and other than a lock or other than, you know, maybe one of them plugs in at a right angle rather than coming straight out for more convenient cable routing, say to an optical drive. Other than that, they're pretty much the same thing. It comes down to the quality of the wiring running inside, the quality of the connection between the pins and the drive, and everything is done at the controller side. So that means between the controller that's on your motherboard and this motherboard right here has SATA 2 controllers as well as SATA 3 controllers, and then that communication with the controller on your drive, in this case of this drive, it's a SATA 3 controller drive, this one is SATA 2, okay? That's where all of the magic happens in terms of changes of speed. So I'm going to show you guys all the different kinds of SATA cables that I was able to gather up. So I found my old one, which just has the little lock inside the connector. I found uh, my newer one here, which is a nice slim cable compared to a, a bulkier cable that you can see next to it. I hope you can see that because it's going to be black on black. Can they see that cameraman? They can, okay, so there's a nice flexible slim one. I've got a right angle one. There are even left angle ones, which will, which will come out the other side in, just in case you have a configuration where you want it to come right out of the drive this way to go somewhere. They come in a variety of lengths. So this is about as long as a SATA cable is, is going to tend to be right here. So you can compare that to a more typical one. So if you have to do a longer run or personally I use these for test bench purposes because then I can run something off the connector and then I can like, you know, have a drive connected way in the heck in the middle of nowhere. So none of that really matters. What's important is the controllers and the drives and the speeds that you want to be running at. Now, there's a little bit of confusion with respect to SAS. So we'll be talking about that in just a moment. This is a SAS controller card. Okay, it has these uh, special connectors on the top called SFF8087. So I go ahead and plug one of these in. And that leads to four things on the other end that look awfully suspiciously like SATA. So like I said, just like all the different speeds of SATA, it's not about the physical shape of the connector, it's about what is electrically on the other side. So if you hook up a SAS controller to a SAS drive, you're gonna get extra SAS functionality. It's going to enable things like longer cables, because it has a stronger signal strength. It's going to enable more data security and reliability features because SAS is designed for enterprise, whereas SATA is designed for home and office use. Okay, now here's where the confusion comes in. If I have a SAS drive and I try and run it off my consumer motherboard, it won't work because a SATA controller cannot control a SAS drive. However, if I take my SAS controller and I plug it into a SATA drive, that will work. So that's where some people do get confused about these differences in connection or these similarities in connections between SATA and SAS. Now another good use for high speed SATA connections is going to be when you're actually connecting multiple drives. So you can use multipliers in order to take one single SATA connection and this is especially relevant for eSATA. So I'll show you guys. eSATA runs at exactly the same speed as its internal cousin. The only difference is that it is an external connector. So eSATA can typically be used to connect to something like a storage tower, something like a Drobo, where you've actually got multiple drives connected. So you can make use of all of that throughput just by connecting more than one drive to a single interface.
So I hope you guys have enjoyed our little episode on demystifying the different types of SATA connections and SATA drives that exist on the market. And please leave a comment under the video and let me know if you have decided to upgrade to a higher level of SATA. So you're running SATA 2, maybe you want to grab a SATA 3 board and SSD and upgrade right away. Don't forget to subscribe to NCIX Tech Tips.